uh, launched this in the last year during the course of the pandemic uh, as an activity which would, um, uh, as part of our many outreach activities, and this is one which we aim towards undergraduate students, college students uh, in a variety of disciplines in science, uh, STEM disciplines, if you wish, uh, uh, in uh, trying to communicate some interesting um, very exciting areas of contemporary research, uh, primarily in, in the sciences and mathematics, uh, to uh, to the undergraduate audience to get them, give them a flavor of uh, some of the developments and uh, some of the work being done in Indian institutions by our researchers and uh, uh, the different opportunities. Therefore, uh, that uh, people who would like to continue with research will have in our institutions in the country. So this has been very popular and we've had a number of uh, very interesting talks. Uh, uh, you can see the previous editions of this talk on the ICTS uh, YouTube page or the ICTS webpage. Uh, I would encourage you to browse through both of these. Uh, the ICTS webpage has a lot of information, especially about upcoming activities and other things. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which will also uh, tell you about the latest videos being uploaded there. And uh, you can go back and visit all the past videos. Uh, so ICTS, as you perhaps may know, many of you may have attended our events before, but we have a number of different events. Vigyan Adda is one of them. Uh, by the way, uh, Adda is a uh, Bengali primarily term for kind of a discussion and the spirit of these talks is to kind of have um, have a more interactive uh, atmosphere and I think the speaker today will also be uh, uh, doing that. Um, but apart from Vigyanadda, we have Copy with Curiosity, which uh, was uh, curiosity during quarantine, during the pandemic times in an online avatar, but before and now um, since the last month or so, we have been having in-person uh, events of uh, KWK uh, at the Nehru Planetarium in Bangalore. Uh, for those of you who are in Bangalore, you can come in person and uh, see uh, and uh, participate in these events. But uh, we also uh, live stream them like this event. We live stream e uh, these events as well over YouTube and uh, you can also participate there by typing in questions uh, and so on. Uh, we have a number of other public lecture series uh, and uh, ICTS's outreach is very active. We've started a math circle, so especially since many of you who are here are people who are uh, interested in maths. Uh, we've started a math circle for trying to uh, uh, encourage and nurture mathematical talent at the middle school level uh, and that uh, will hopefully also become have in-person avatars uh, soon. We had started in a small way before the pandemic, but now in the pandemic, we have been having uh, these online versions of this math circles uh, idea. But again, you can browse on our webpage and you'll see uh, some of the resources uh, um, available there for uh, math circles. Uh, the, apart from that, um, uh, outreach is just one uh, component of ICTS, uh, ICTS, as you know, is the International Center for Theoretical Sciences. It is a part of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, uh, which uh, is uh, now a multi-centered institution, not just in Mumbai uh, as the original uh, TIFR was, but now uh, with multiple centers, with three in Bangalore itself, uh, there is the TIFR Center for Applicable Mathematics uh, in Yelahanka, uh, the ICTS and the NCBS or the National Center for for biological sciences. So there are three in Bangalore already, uh, and there are others in Pune, Hyderabad, et cetera. Uh, and um, I should also mention the Homi Baba Center for Science Education uh, in Mumbai is also a center of the uh, TIFR and is very actively involved in science education. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, ICTS's special mandate is that uh, um, is sort of threefold apart from outreach, 
we have a very active research, which all components of TIFR uh, have, uh, all the centers of TIFR have. Our researchers at ISCTS work in theoretical physics, mathematics, uh, and uh, uh, soon in we will be having people in computer science. And uh, we also have a growing a quantitative biology uh, group. Uh, so that, uh, um, uh, and research here um, uh, consists of um, uh, uh, is is in this is is in the in these theoretical sciences, but it's at the integrated. PhD as well as the PhD level. So people uh, who are, we admit people even after their bachelor's, three-year bachelor's degree. And uh, you and we have a number of ways of admitting people uh, through the gate and the jest exams, and as well as the TIFR graduate studies exam, which is conducted by TIFR uh, All India. Uh, and um, so please, if you're interested in our graduate program, again, please look at our webpage and you'll find uh, uh, in details about how to, uh, to apply uh, for uh, these programs. Uh, currently, we have graduate programs in mathematics and uh, physics, and uh, we are also beginning one in conjunction with other TIFR centers in quantitative biology. Uh, so these are the three streams in which we take uh, people. Uh, by the way, our maths PhD program is jointly with TIFR CAM, uh, the Center for Applicable Mathematics. So uh, uh, people who join through this program have a chance to work with mathematicians at both uh, centers. Uh, so that's about our research briefly. And uh, uh, finally, we also have a very active uh, set of uh, program activities throughout the year, uh, which um, uh, which are um, uh, uh, which are organized by researchers from around the world uh, and people uh, um, uh, experts come as part of these programs to give both pedagogical lectures as well as uh, technical research seminars and it's a way of fostering collaboration between young Indian researchers uh, well Indian researchers of all ages and uh, experts from around the world, but particularly directed towards young researchers in that we have pedagogical lectures, typically at the graduate student level. So if any of you uh, who are interested in particular topics, uh, for instance, if you're interested in probability, you will find multiple uh, programs that we've had in the past on uh, research areas and probability, and you'll find a a lectures by some of the best experts in the world uh, in many of these uh, areas. So it's a good chance to sort of um, uh, get yourself deeper uh, into particular areas. So if you want to go beyond the popular level uh, talks, uh, again, I invite you to browse our uh, uh, ICTS talks, the YouTube channel that we have. So uh, that's uh, more or less a brief uh, little uh, overview of uh, what ICTS is. Uh, I look forward to seeing many of you again for all our outreach activities. Uh, and uh, with that, let me uh, uh, hand it over to uh, Professor Rukni Day, who will introduce the speaker. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Vigyan Adda. Uh, I, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Parthanil Roy, a mathematician at the Indian, Insti Indian Statistical Institute, who works on probability with connections to ergodic theory, operator algebra, geometric group theory, and hyperbolic dynamics. After completing his PhD from Cornell University, and a postdoctoral fellowship at EPH Zurich. Parthenil was a tenure track assistant professor at Michigan State University before joining Indian Statistical Institute. He has served as the youth representative of Bernoulli Society for Mathematical Statistics and Probability from 2017 to 2020, and is currently an editor of the Shankho Series A. 
He is a recipient of Shorno Jayanti Fellowship 2019 to 2024 and a Young Statistical Scientist Award 2021 from International Indian Statistical Association. So, uh, welcome Parthanil. Today, Parthanil is going to talk about branching random walks, two conjectures, and a theorem. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. That was very nice of you. And also, thanks for the invitation. It's actually a great honor for me uh, to be able to give this talk for multiple reasons. One is this is a very prestigious uh, series of talks. And secondly, I'm able to reach out to a lot of people who are genuinely interested in science, in particular mathematics, but not just mathematics, science in general. So that's a great opportunity. I mean, outreach is a very important component of our job. And, uh, you know, ICTS has done a very good uh, job with respect to that. And uh, I'm just, you know, honored to be able to give this talk here. So before I start, is the volume and uh, the, the voice okay? Should I be... Is the sound okay? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. it is absolutely right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is uh, based on a joint work with Ayan Bhattacharya, who is now in IIT Bombay, and uh, Rajat Shubhra Hajra, who is now in Leiden University. So um, I'll talk about the contributions uh, with this work, etc. but I would like to start with something called an icebreaker. So what is an icebreaker? So icebreaker, if you look at the literal meaning in, in Merriam Webster dictionary, you'll see that it basically means whatever is this seen in this picture. It's a ship which is equipped with um, <coughs> some reinforced bow to make a, a maintained channel through ice. So it breaks the ice, that's why it's called icebreaker. But that's the literal meaning. The figurative meaning on the other hand is something that you do or say to get through the first difficulties in a conversation. So suppose you meet, meet someone, say you, you say you go for a date with someone, okay? First date, what, what, how do you want to start it? So how, whatever way you start is called an icebreaker. But just a word of warning, don't use whatever I'm going to use an, as an icebreaker for your, your first date icebreaker. Because if you do it, you may not be able to get a second date. Anyway, so this is the ice breaking question. So the title of this talk, if you remember, was branching random box, whatever that is. After that, two conjectures and a theorem. Now this name is inspired by a movie. What is the name of the movie? By the way, the reason why I'm having this icebreaker is of course, I want to break the ice from my side so that I can become more comfortable speaking. And secondly, I also want to set the tone of this, this lecture. The lecture is supposed to be more interactive. So I ask all of you to try to answer this in the chat. What is the, if there's a movie from which this name is inspired. Can anyone guess what the movie name is? Either, uh, that's, a, that's a good try, Man Who Knew Infinity, but no. So this two, two conjectures and a theorem that's the hint, two something and a theorem, right? So instead of that, it should be some other number, something and a something, something like that. So instead of two, it would be four. No, no, I, good try. These are all good guesses, very good guesses. I, I see that in the, in the chat, there are already four or five guesses. That's very interactive, but yeah, no. All of them are wrong in the sense, I want something like this. Yes, very good. I think Rajesh has already answered that. Four weddings and a funeral. So this is a British comedy, romantic comedy. It's a very nice one. If you haven't seen it, please see it. Thank you, Rajesh, for the answer. So the answer is four weddings and a funeral. So uh, you see there is an alliteration of four with funerals, FF. Similarly, I have the same thing here, two and theorem. Both are starting with T. So my postdoc advisor, who, uh, who was now is retired, he was in ETH Zurich. He has a theorem, he has a paper, the name of the paper is Four Theorems and a Financial Crisis. So that's also motivated from this particular movie. 
in any case thank you for the answers even if you you know whether it's what's correct or not at least you tried it that's great so um, let me first tell you after the ice breaking question let me first tell you by the way please watch this movie if you haven't okay so why did i choose this topic i mean there are many topics on which i could have given this particular talk but there is a reason why i chose this one <laughs> this has some connection with trains what is the connection the connection is the following about uh, i would say 8 to 9 years ago it's about a decade ago i was traveling by a train on a lazy sunday afternoon this was in at that time i used to live in kolkata uh, i was in isi kolkata now i'm in isi bangalore indian statistical institute bangalore but that time i was in indian statistical institute kolkata and uh, i was traveling by a train i was going from kolkata to a suburb of kolkata for some personal reason i met two school students who asked me what mathematicians do okay now exactly how this transpired i'll tell you the story a little bit more and i'll tell you what i answered them as well okay but before that let me give the context exactly what happened they didn't ask this question out of the blue what happened was what had happened was i was editing a paper that i was writing at that time it happens to be the paper i'm giving the talk about okay so i had a version of the paper and i was editing it i was correcting it and those two students are very curious they asked me what are you doing when i told them what i was doing i was editing a paper i was writing etc cetera, etc cetera, they got really really excited so one of them asked so you are actually proving a new theorem and before i could answer that you know rhetorical question the other one said ah i know what scientists do what do what do mathematicians do exactly so this is the context now it was really nice to see this excitement in the eyes of two young bright students you know these are i think class 11 12 students maybe so before answering their question i thought that maybe i should ask them what they think you know about uh, <clears throat> mathematicians or scientists in general so i uh, i asked them uh, the, the the guy who the, the student who said i know what scientists do i asked him so what do scientists do and his answer was very clear you know my scientist friends sound like it but what he said was scientists they just mix a red solution with a blue one and produce a green solution in the end in their labs that that is a very clear cut answer so yeah, i thought of bursting into you know laughter but i didn't do it but what i did is i actually used this description given by our my, my young friend to tell what 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 mathematicians do and here was my answer i said we also mix a red theorem and a blue theorem and you know after mixing we get a green theorem out of it that's precisely what we do you know what we do in the papers are not always really fancy things that comes out of nothing it of course has some basis and the basis being the red theorem and blue theorem in this case and then the output is a green theorem so it's just a, you know just a nice way of describing what we do and since i really loved the amazement in those students eyes and i loved uh, how how excited they were to know that you know i was proving a new theorem even though i told them repeatedly that you know i'm just using some of the results already known it's not a really big thing etc cetera, etc cetera. but i really still remember the amazement in their eyes and the awe in their eyes and uh, in spite of my efforts to water down what uh, you know uh, the theorem may be uh, but uh, you know because of that i decided that some day i'll definitely tell the story and perhaps i'll try to give a talk reaching out to students based on this particular work that particular work so this is the reason why i chose this topic okay so a few things before we actually start one thing is that i want this talk to be very interactive and i have a slight cold as you can perhaps hear my voice so i'll go very slowly please feel free to ask questions in the chat 
you know, I'll try to follow the chat. If not, the moderator at least will ask the questions on your behalf at some point. After each 15 minutes approximately, we'll take a break. 15 may not be 15, it can be 20 also. When we take the break, we'll allow questions to be asked or comments to be made using the microphone. You can unmute, you'll, you'll be able to unmute yourself. The moderator will unmute you so that you can ask the questions during the break, okay? And in the end, there'll be a dis detailed discussion session. And uh, as I say repeatedly, please ask questions. And I already saw that when I asked this uh, ice breaking question, there were a few answers, which means there are people who are really interactive. So I'm really looking forward to giving this talk to all of you. Okay, so please ask a lot of questions. I want this talk to be interactive. There's no point giving a talk if it's not interactive. Okay, so with that uh, motivation and why I'm giving the talk, etc., let me now get into the business. So I'm going to talk about what is called first, I'm going to tell you what is a random walk. Now, this talk is about branching random walk, but uh, before branching random walk, I'm going to tell you what is a random walk. And if you ask me what is random walk roughly, I would say it's a walk by a completely drunk person on integers. Now, what do I mean by a walk on integers? So suppose you have a street on which you have numbers marked, 0, 1, 2, 3, on the other hand, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, etc. And a completely drunk person starts at zero and then at a time moves only one step, either towards right or towards left, okay? Which means either towards plus direction or towards minus direction. And randomly, he or she chooses the direction. Now you may ask why would someone do that, right? The answer is because that person is drunk, okay? So here is a way to do it. So for example, so, Another way of thinking of it, instead of thinking with, with equal chance, either plus one or minus one step, you can think of it this way. The person, the drunk person has a coin in his hand, his or her hand. And the coin is an unbiased coin. Unbiased meaning the coin, the, the probability of getting a head and probability of getting a tail are equal and they're both 50%. Now what this drunk person does, is he or she tosses this coin. And then if it's a head, he or she takes a step towards the right side in this picture, which means he, takes a, he or she takes a step on the positive side, plus one side. So for example, the first toss maybe gives a head. So yeah. So then because of that, he or she took the step towards plus one and you know, at the point one. He's at, he or she is at the point one. Then again, another toss, this again gave a head. So he or she moved to two. Again, another toss of a coin. This time it's tail. So mo move back to one. So taking a step towards negative side means reducing it by one. So from two, you move to one. Again, another toss, <coughs> perhaps this time, <coughs> Again, it produced head, so he or she went to two. Then again, a tail, so it came back to one. And then another tail came back to zero. Another tail came back to minus one. Another tail came back to minus two. Okay? So the idea is every time you start at zero and every time you toss the coin, the coin is fair, so 50% chance of getting a head or a tail. If it's a head, you move towards plus one direction. You just move one direction towards the right. If it's a tail, you move towards left one step. That's all. So this is the description. Now I'll write it down more mathematically. So <clears throat> this is called simple random walk on integers. Why is it simple? It's simple because at a time, we are only taking step plus one or minus one. That, that's why this is simple. Okay, so here is the description. Start at zero, okay? So this person starts at zero. Toss a fair coin. So fair coin meaning, yes, that's a good question. I'm using the same coin 
I'll, I'll, I'll describe and then it will become clear. I'm using the same coil, but I'm assuming that the outcomes of the tosses are going to be independent. Okay, that's a good question, Ravi. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so you toss the coin, it's a fair coin. So with probability half, you'll get a head. With probability half, you'll get a tail. If head appears, which happens with 50% chance, you take a step in the plus one direction. If tail appears, you take a step towards the minus one direction. Now comes the point that Ravi already asked. So are you using the same coin? Ravi asked this question. So toss the same coin, say. Doesn't matter. As long as it's a fair coin, it's fine. But you should toss it in an independent fashion. So what do I mean by independent fashion? <coughs> by independent fashion, I mean that whatever outcome now I should have should not depend on what outcome I had before. The first toss may have given me a head, but when, when I'm tossing the second time, I should not remember that I had got head in the first one. Okay? So the two tosses should be independent of each other in the sense they should not influence each other. So you toss it in an, indi in an independent fashion. Again, if head appears, you take a step towards plus one. If tail appears, take a step towards minus one. Now you repeat this four and five, these two steps again and again. So you, wherever you are, from that position, you toss a coin. If it's a head, you go plus one. If it's a tail, you go minus one. So this is called simple random walk. And this simple, I'll just stress this here. So this simple, so the word simple comes from the fact that we are only taking plus one and minus one steps. That's why it's called simple. Simple meaning I'm keeping life simple. I'm only taking one step at a time. It can be either on the positive direction or on the negative direction. But the <coughs> step size is always one. It can be plus one or minus one, depending on the direction. But the step size is one. Okay. I think this is a good time, even though I haven't talked too much yet. It's a good time to ask questions or concerns or comments, anything you have. So any questions? Is it clear what is a simple random walk? You can either, you can write down the question in the chat. And if the question is on the YouTube channel, I think the moderator is going to post it here. So I'll be able to read them. If not, uh, you can just post the question in the chat and the moderator is going to unmute you also if needed. Okay, so since there is no question, let me go ahead. It seems that so far I haven't covered much. It was more about uh, icebreaker, etc. So there's no question yet. So let's move on. Okay, so I'll show you this. Yes, there's a question already. Yeah. Okay, so the question, I'll read it because people who are following it from YouTube won't be able to see it. So the question is, I think it is um, Amit Kumar has asked this question. We can also use a die, even, even number towards positive and odd number towards left. Yeah, I understand, yes. So what uh, uh, Amit said is correct. You can use a die, say a fair die. If you get an even number, you take a positive step. If you get an odd number, you take a negative step. That again will ensure you, you take a positive step and a negative step with probability half and half. So that is correct. Thank you. Um, why is the expected distance in one dimension of the order of square root n? That, if I have to answer that question, that has, will take away too much uh, from the talk. Um, so the next question was asked by Arush Murali which the question was, why is the expected distance in one dimension of the order square root n? <coughs> so let me explain what this means. What it means is that after n steps, you're expected to be around square root n away from the origin. Now, why is it so? This comes from, I won't say much. I'll just say this comes from a very 
famous theorem called central limit theorem. If you, if you know what it is, then <coughs> you can explain why it's square root n. I don't want to get in too much into it, okay? So it comes from central limit theorem. Now, what is random in this work? <coughs> there are two randomness here. One is that a drunk person is walking. So a drunk person is totally random. But jokes apart, the randomness comes from the fact <coughs> sorry, that you are either taking a positive step or a negative step with probability half and half. It's not clear whether you will take a positive step or a negative step. That's why it is random. Okay. So you're tossing a coin, output of the coin toss is random. Whether it's head or tail, you don't know. So that's why it's random. Okay. So if you're always taking a tip, step towards positive side, that's not a random walk. But since you're taking sometimes positive, sometimes negative, depending on what the toss is giving you, this is a random walk. Okay, even after a larger number of coin flips, quite possible. It could. Yeah, so what uh, R. Goel has asked, even after a large number of coin flips, it's possible that the total movement would be effective movement would be small. In the sense that after movements, you'll come back. It's quite you'll, you'll, you'll go on go on staying between, say, minus 2 and 2. But it can be shown using some mathematics that such a thing is not possible. With very high chance, you will actually be approximately square root n away after n steps. This can be shown as somebody asked already. Okay. Now, what is the difference between axiom and a theorem? Okay. So axiom, so this is a more um, not directly related to uh, this uh, talk perhaps, but let me still answer it. So an axiom is basically a set of a set of, uh, a set of uh, postulates, a set of assumptions that you make before you go into a theory. I mean, so if you remember Euclidean axioms, in Euclidean geometry, there were some axioms, right? Like two parallel lines won't intersect, etc., etc. Those were axioms. These are things that you assume for sure. You don't try to prove them. These are like your postulates. These are like your uh, these are like truth that you assume for, for always. And theorem is something you deduce using those axioms or a theorem before. Okay? So you must have seen this in Euclidean geometry. There were a set of axioms that Euclid assumed. And then using, using those axioms, he went on proving things. Okay? There were theorems that we, we, we have seen right, in Euclidean geometry. So axioms, I would say, are assumptions or postulates that we, we just use them to develop a theory. And theorem is something that we prove using those axioms or a theorem that we have already proved. Okay, so there's a question from the YouTube chat. Rohit Gupta has asked, uh, simple random walk is in 1D. Yes, so this is uh, what I'm describing is a simple random walk on Z or simple random walk in one dimension. Yes, you can similarly give simple random walk in other dimensions too. Okay, another question in you on YouTube is that, isn't the mean of a simple random walk zero, then what would be high chance to be okay? So again, so the question is this, mean of the simple random walk is zero, then what is it meant by the high chance to be around square root n? Again, I would say that this I can't explain, this needs something called central limit theorem, which is beyond the scope of this particular talk. So I would suggest that, you know, after the talk, maybe you can Google this phrase central limit theorem, and then you will be able to, you'll be able to uh, get it. central limit theorem. If you, if you, if you Google it, you'll see what it is. And then you will see what's what, what exactly I meant by square. Root. <clears throat> when is a statement an accepted action? That's a very good question. It's very philosophical. It depends on what you want to want to prove, what you want to put at an axiom. It's it's a very difficult question, honestly. So uh, it all depends on your your, your outlook, what you want to put as an axiom, etc. Okay, another question from YouTube: Is the per, if the person gets heads four times consecutively and moves plus one four times? Yes, it's still still a random walk. So the question was. If the person gets hit four times consecutively and moves 
plus one four times, is it still a random walk? You mean it may feel like okay, four consecutive plus ones, not possible, but actually you will see there will be such things, consecutive plus ones. That's okay, it's still random because you're always tossing a coin. So it's still random. There's nothing non-random about it. Okay, so I think I have answered the questions for now. Let me move on. Thank you for all the questions. It's very interactive. Okay, so then <clears throat> I'll just quickly show you this movie, which is basically how the random walk would look if you just you know have a movie there. So this is how it would look. Okay. This is like, like how, how the movement would do. So essentially every time you get a head, you're moving towards a plus one direction. Every time you're getting a tail, you're moving towards a minus one direction. Now I said that simple random walk, the simplicity comes from the fact that you are always taking a one step, either plus one or minus one. Okay, it can be in the negative direction, but the step size is always one. Now, going beyond simplicity, you will have more general random walk. <clears throat> so this is called random walk on integers. I'm calling it any random walk. It basically just means random walk on integers. It's basically the same dynamics. You start at zero and you move. But now, you're not necessarily taking a step either towards a plus one side or towards a minus one. You can take any step. What do I mean by that? So I'll give the mathematical description. It might look a bit too serious, but don't worry too much about it. I'm going to explain it to you. What you do is the following. You have every integer i. For every integer i, you, you, you have a non-negative real number pi in such a way that these pi's add up to one, okay? So maybe I'll write uh, all of them, I'll keep together and then I'll write here. So what I mean by this is that for every i, I have a pi and this pi's, as you take sum over i belonging to z, the sum is one, okay? So now what is the role of this pi in this whole game? The role is the following. You start at zero as usual. Now you take a step i with probability pi. So pi is add up to one, the total probability is one. So now what you do is you take a step i with probability pi. So pi is the probability that you take a step of size i. When I say i, i can be negative as well. <clears throat> okay, so um, quickly a question, how to guide such a walk in a higher dimensional space through dice? Yes, that's, a, that's correct. In two dimension, you can move in four directions and then you can say that you'll, you'll have a dice if one, two or three or four occurs, you will move to one of those directions. And if it's five or six, you won't move any at all. You can do like that. So in higher dimension, how do you guide random walk was the question. And you can use a dice instead of a coin. Or you can toss a coin two times. A fair coin, you talk, toss it two times. If head it appears, you move towards north. If head tail appears, you move towards south. If tail head appears, you move towards east. If tail tail appears, you move towards west. You can do it this way also. Okay, anyway, so coming back to one dimension. So instead of simplicity, now I have more complex random walk. So you, you go to i with probability pi. Now then what you do, in an independent fashion, you take another step j with probability pj. So by that I mean, suppose you are on i, you are at i, okay? Now you go to i plus j with probability pj. Probability is pj. When I say i plus j, j can be negative and then check i plus j can be on the left side of i as well, but I'm just showing you the picture like this. So you go from i to i plus j with probability pj. And you repeat this step again and again. So in case of simple random walk, if you forget everything else, in case of simple random walk, what was there was this P of one was half, P of minus one also was half. All the other PIs were zero. So you're only taking steps either plus one or minus one with probabilities half and half respectively. 
okay? Here you are generalizing it to any step, any integer step. Now forget everything else, all the mathematics I've written using this uh, ash color, you can completely ignore it. You just remember this part. You just remember that, you know, same dynamics, except we are allowing any integer step. So you don't take plus minus one step anymore. You can take any step and how you take a step is determined by a probability distribution, which is given by these PIs. That's all. So in a summary, instead of taking plus minus one step, you're taking any possible step. That's the idea. Any question on the model? Okay, there are two questions I saw. One is from YouTube, so let me read it. Uh, use dice for the multiple step random walk. Yes, you can do that also. For multiple step random walk also, you can use a dice. Yes, for example, you can say that at a time you will only take plus minus one, plus minus two and plus minus three steps. And then you can throw a dice. If it's one, two or three, you will take steps one, two, three. If, if it's four, five or six occur, you will take a step minus one, minus two and minus three respectively. You can of, of course use a dice. Okay, uh, what is I here? So I here denotes the step size. So from zero, so, okay, let me draw the picture. So what is I here? So, oh, sorry, I always make this mistake. I forget to, <clears throat> anyway. So, so in the first step, you are, you are at zero, right? From zero, you will go to one of the numbers, say I, I can be positive or negative. This jump will happen with probability PI. Okay. <clears throat> so the I here denotes the step size. Do such PIs exist? So basically PIs are given to you for a particular random walk. PIs will be given to you. This is a probability distribution, step size distribution. Okay. Distribution of your step size. So that will be given to you. Exist meaning it will, it will be given to you. Okay, so then is it possible to take a step having step size of infinity? No, uh, here I'm not allowing going to infinity at all. Okay, I can take a very large step. I can take a step of size 1000, 10,000 or a million, something like that. But I'm not allowing a step size of infinity. Okay, that's not allowed in this game. Okay. Uh, another question from YouTube, please suggest one choice of PI. Okay, so that's a good question. I'm, I'm very happy that there are so many questions, which means that, <coughs> so here is a choice. So one choice of PIs. So maybe I'll write, I'll go back and write. Okay, I have a, I have a blank page. I'll write there. Yeah. So here is a choice of PI. You take P1 to be half, P of minus one to be half, all other PIs to be zero. Okay, if this happens, then you are always taking either a plus or minus one step. What did I do? Plus or minus one step at a time. Just one minute. Yeah. So this is basically boils down to the simple random walk. So this blue thing is just simple random walk. Now let me give you another one, something different. Suppose you take P1 to be one fourth, P2 to be one fourth, okay? P of minus one to be one fourth and P of minus two to be one fourth. All other PI is zero because add, they have to add up to one. Here, I don't have a simple random walk. I have a random walk whose step sizes are either plus minus one, plus minus two step sizes. So wherever you are, you either take a plus one step or a plus two step or a minus one step or a minus two step. All of these you do with equal probability. Okay, this is another example. Okay. 
all PIs, no, 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 PIs not, may not be the same. Here I'm giving examples where things are same, but it can so happen that they are not same also. Like for example, here itself, I could have done the following. This is called biased random walk. So here, for example, I could have said, okay, I, if this won't remain a simple random walk anymore. So I would say, say I'll say P half, P of one is one third, P of minus one is two third. So this would be, this will be called biased nearest neighbor random walk. So this means, for example, you take a step plus one with probability one third, but you take a step minus one with probability two third. So that means you have a bias towards the negative side. More often you will move towards the negative side. And for such a random walk, it can be shown that you are going to go off towards the mi minus infinity. You're going to go off towards the left end somehow. It can be shown. Anyway, so let's uh, move on now. So in general, in the, the moral of the story is forget about all this IPI business. The moral is whatever I have marked here using yellow is that it's the same dynamics, except that instead of the step sizes being plus minus one, I'm allowing any possible step sizes with any possible probability distribution on them. Okay, fine. So I is the step size and PI is the probability of that particular step size. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about branching simple random walk. So this branching part is new. Earlier, I only had simple random walk. Now I'm, I'm going to give you example of branching simple random walk. Now, what is that? Before I describe it, let me show you how the model will grow and how it will look. Again, just like random walk, this will start with a point or a particle maybe at origin, at zero. Now, this is how it would look. This particle will actually split into two particles and move. I'll show you even better pictures, but now at least try to see how, how it goes. So there are two particles now. From here, it'll, each particle will split into two. So total of four particles could be there. And then each of them would move. So at time two or generation two, you will get four particles. Then each four particle will now, each of these four particles will now split into two and you will get eight particles at time three or generation three. So this is how it will move. So earlier there was only one person, one drunk person walking. Now there are many particles and they are branching and they are making random walks. That's why it's called branching simple random walk. But what I showed you didn't explain at all what this model is. Now let me try to explain it. Okay. <laughs> here, is the here is the dynamics of this model. At generation zero or time zero, time or generation I'll use in a, in a interchangeably. Okay, either generation zero or time zero. You have one particle, and this particle is at the origin at zero. Okay. Now what happens in generation one? This particle splits or branches into two particles. Each of this particle either takes a plus one step or a minus one step with probability half and half, okay? So it doesn't, it can happen that both of them will go to the same place. Both of them will take plus one step. That's also possible, okay? Now, so suppose one of them took plus one step, another one took minus one step, the way it's described here. So that forms generation one. Now what happens is each of these particles that again will split into two. Each of them will split into two particles and each particle will either take a plus one step or a minus one step. Namely, in this case, the particle which was 
okay let me let me mark it here this one this particle split into two particles uh somebody asked a question will some of them die in the due course no in this case we are not allowing uh, any death okay we are just allowing splitting of particles and propagation we are not allowing any death so will any particle die is the question no there is no no death possible as of now okay so this particle which was it in this position that i have marked here using blue this particle split into two particles but both moved towards plus 1 so now you see two of them in plus 2 position in two position on the other hand the particle that was that i am marking using pink that was at the minus 1 position this one split into two particles but these two particles <coughs> one of them went to took a plus one step another one took a minus one step so one of them came here the other one came here so in generation 2 you will see four particles one at minus one uh, minus two one at zero two at two again now all this will go away all this drawing i have done will go away next one what happens is this one the one that was at zero so remember so let me start from this one the one the one that was at minus 2 split into two one of them took a minus one step so it went to minus 3 other one took a plus one step came to <coughs> minus 1 on the other hand this guy here which was at zero split into two both of them took minus one step both of them came to minus one now here it's not clear what has happened but suppose this has happened so there were two particles one of them split into two both of them came here and there was another one this one both of them came here okay so now you see that there are there are eight particles in generation 3 among which one is at minus 3 three are at minus 1 two are at plus 1 and two are at plus 3 and this happened because of this entire dynamics that i have shown you okay maybe i'll i'll remove all these things and then ask you if you have any question on this model now so so is that clear what's happening is there any question so so for example here this particle instead of particle you may also think of it as a bacterium instead of particle you may think of some organism which is splitting or uh, into two new organisms okay and both of the new organisms are making a plus or minus one step so this guy split into two and then gave rise to a point in plus one and minus one in generation one similarly this dynamics went on for each particle the same dynamics went on okay so so if you do this the same thing i have shown you using this genealogy etc so here i am showing you the genealogy what do i mean by genealogy i'm telling you which particle came from which particles so who is which particles parent who is which particles grandparent etc i'm showing you the entire tree the entire generation you know however genealogy however when you actually see this you don't see that you just see this snapshot this is the snapshot of generation 0 this is the snapshot of generation 1 this is the snapshot of generation 2 this is the snapshot of generation 3 and so on so you don't know which particle has come from which particle you just see the particles okay so there is a question let me answer that so the question is is there any chance that the third generation takes a step <coughs> with some different probability no so all of them are taking a step either plus 1 or minus 1 with probability half and half respectively so i'm not allowing change in that okay okay so so the question was sorry let me read the question for people who are attending from youtube is there any chance that the third generation takes a step with some different probability 
and I said, no, the rule is every new particle that is born after splitting will either take a plus one step or take a minus one step with equal probability. Okay. Okay. And this is a good time to take a break and look for questions. Is there any question? So maybe I will go back to this picture and keep it because this picture seems to be the key thing here. So any question on this picture from YouTube or from Zoom? <clears throat> so as I said repeatedly, each particle or bacterium or some organism in, is splitting into two particles. Each of the new particles now either takes a plus one step or a minus one step independently of each other. Important point is they're all moving independently of each other. I'm going to write all these things down, but I wanted to first show you this picture and this dynamics so that it becomes clear. Okay, so there is a question, let me see. Perhaps this is a question from YouTube. Will the peak of stacks after n generations? Sorry, <clears throat> a lot of questions. So let me answer them one by one. It'll be root n. How would the compute the expected height of stack? And okay, so this uh, this question is hard. It all so the question that has been asked was, will the peak of stacks after n generation would be square root n? The answer is no. Actually, not. It depends on what kind of step size distribution you are taking. And it's not going to be square root n, the peak of the stacks. Okay. So <clears throat> there is, a, it's going to be more than that, most of the cases. Okay. So, but that's a good question. The peak of stacks after n steps is a very important question. Okay. So, another question is it same as the logistic equation? Well, there is some relation with logistic equation, perhaps. But this is not exactly logistic equation, but it's something like that. Something like that. Uh, all the particles are identical or by each split, any change happens. Assume all of them are identical, okay? Assume that all the particles are identical. That's best. In some case, uh, whether it's a period doubling phenomenon, at, some, at each step, you're doubling the number of particles. So yes, there's some doubling phenomenon. I think. Okay. Looking by the picture of third generation, can we predict the structure of, uh, okay, so can we predict the structure of the state in, uh, you know, from the third generation? So that's a very good question. So it's not so easy. It's not so easy because what you will see in the third generation, you will only see these eight particles and then trying to figure out who came from which particle is not so easy. There are too many possibilities and that's a very difficult question. Okay. Okay. There are too many questions. So let me go one by one. So will getting accumulated minus one be higher? No, not necessarily. There'll be no accumulation at a very particular point. There'll be nothing like that. Can we think a particle at generation zero, a superposition? Sorry. What is this? One minute. Generation zero is in supervision state and the probability that particle moves towards plus infinity. I don't know what you mean by superposition state, but definitely probability that the particles are moving towards plus infinity and minus infinity are always equal because of the, because of the symmetry of the system. But I'm not sure what exactly you mean by superposition uh, state. Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask Abhishek Mina. Is it possible to unmute Abhishek Mina? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Abhishek, can you ask the question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Hi, yes. Hello, sir. I am audible. Yes, yes. Tell me. By superposition, position, I mean uh, the particle, if we are non, not looking at it, it is in superposition state. It means the probability of, uh, I mean, uh, Every possible state are uh, exist at the same time. Okay. 
Okay. If we are not observing the particle, so that's uh, the superposition. Okay. Uh, well, definitely then in your language, then definitely it is in superposition state. Yeah. Yeah. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. So how do we return to the dynamics given the outcome? Again, this is very difficult. So what perhaps this question is asking is that suppose in generation three, you observe this thing. How do you know which particle came from which parent and which who's whose grandparent? Which of these two particles are brothers or sisters, siblings? Okay. And which are, which have a common grandparent, etc. All these questions are very, very difficult. Okay. And that's what makes this analysis very difficult as well. There's a question from YouTube. Uh, what is the application of random walk dynamics? So the application is huge. So what is the application of random walk? So perhaps you have heard this term Brownian motion. This is something that was discovered by Robert Brown, a botanist. So a movement of pollen grain, very zigzag motion. And then the famous papers were written by none other than Albert Einstein, who discussed more formally what is a Brownian motion. It has relations to physics and botany, of course, and various other subjects. Random walk can be used to study Brownian motion. So in some sense, random walk, if scaled properly, becomes Brownian motion in the limit. So for analysis of Brownian motion, random walk can be used. So that's another application. So there are many applications. <laughs> this is definitely one of them. Okay. So <laughs> I think there was one last question. Let me just read that. I'll just read it from here. <clears throat> Sorry. So for each generation, either odd numbers on the line will be populated. <clears throat> uh, you can say that because not necessarily, but yeah. Yeah, because plus one, minus one. So there is a parity, yes. There, you're right. Ritika, you're right. There is a parity involved here. So yeah. So because every time you're taking plus or minus one step, so in the odd generations, you're only at <coughs> odd sites, odd, odd places. In even generations, you're even places. So you're right. Ritika, you're right. Uh, <laughs> the question by Uthpal, there is no history returned here, correct? Yes, that's correct. There is no history returned here. So the point is, you just only see what's, what's coming in the nth generation. You only see a snapshot of the nth generation. So you don't see the history. And what are the connections with probability theory, etc.? It will come become clear as we move on. Okay, let's move on now. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cough, as I said, so I'll have some water. Okay, so let me now move on. So there are some still some questions that I missed. No, I think you're, I've answered more or less everything. Okay, so, so this is how I'll describe it mathematically. Okay, branching simple random walk. So start with one particle at position zero. This is called the zeroth generation. The particle branches or splits. Branches also mean splits, okay, into two particles. Each new particle tosses a fair coin independently of each other and takes a step plus one or minus one, depending on whether head or tail appears. Okay, so each new particle is now performing a random walk. So it's branching followed by random walk. That's why it's called branching random walk. So branching means splitting. Okay. This gives rise to the first generation. We saw that. Each particle now in the first generation now repeats step two and three independently of each other. And this process goes on. Okay. So this is this gives rise to branching random walk. So this is obviously wordy description. But I have already shown you the picture, so I guess things are clear. So again, I would like to stress here, I call it simple because every time it splits into two and each of them 
is going either towards plus one or minus one. So that's why it's called simple branching random walk or branching simple random walk. Okay. Now you can have any branching random walk on integers. Now, what does that mean? It means it's the same dynamics. You will have splitting followed by a movement. Now, the movement may not be plus minus one anymore. Just like we went from simple random walk. Remember, so I'll write it here maybe. So from simple random walk, we went to any random walk, remember? And how did you do it? In simple random walk, P1 was P minus one was equal to half. All other PIs were zero, right? And here I gave you for each I, I gave you a PI. And the step size I has probability PI to happen. That's how we did it, right? Same thing happens in branching random walk also. So instead of, so by the way, same dynamics meaning each time you're splitting into two particles still, okay? But those two particles independently of each other, now instead of moving only plus minus one step can move any integer step. That's precisely what is happening. So for each integer i, again, you fix a real number pi such that they sum up to one. Maybe I'll go all the way and then describe. So basically you have that the sum of pi as i runs over z equals one. Z meaning set of integers. Okay, maybe I'll write it in a way that doesn't hamper the reading. Sorry, I one minute, I'll just erase it and write it again. <clears throat> so I got so used to writing like this that I think when I start teaching online, offline, I haven't done it yet, but when I start teaching offline, I'll most probably expect that whatever I did on my iPad can also be done on the, on the board. So that's going to be interesting. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I think Ravi has asked a question. Can a particle stay in the same position? That's a very good question. Yes, so P0 can be, so what I what Ravi asked is this PI is, can P0 be positive? P0 is the probability that your particle becomes lazy in the sense the particle, wherever it is, stay, stays put, doesn't move at all. This is allowed. The question is whether this is allowed. The answer is yes, it's allowed. Okay. Okay, so what you do here, you start with, one particle at position zero, this is the zero generation. The particle splits into two particles. Each new particle step takes a step i with probability pi independent of each other. So this pi is a probability distribution of the steps. Now this gives rise to the first generation. Now each particle repeats steps two and three independent of each other, and this process goes on, okay? So basically you are branching and taking a random walk, branching and then doing a random, walk, performing a random. Walk. That's why it's called branching random. Branching just means splitting, okay? So in the branching simple random walk, of course, just like before, P1 and P minus one are equal to half and all the other PIs are zero, okay? Okay, any question? Because now we are going into the heart of the talk. So I'm really excited. So far, so good, I think. But lots of questions have been asked, which means people are actually interested in the topic. Okay. Now, so far, I was only telling you whether it was random walk or it was branching random walk, everything was happening on the integers. Namely, the drunk person was always walking on integers. One, two, minus one, minus two, three, four, 2000, et cetera. But there is honestly no reason why that should happen. You might take a step, which is not necessarily an integer. Your step size can be a continuous variable. Okay, can be 1.2, 3.71, etc., And that is allowed. So branching random walk on the real line, by real line, I mean, now I don't have the number line as the integer line. I have the entire real line. Everything is same, except that the step sizes no longer be integers. They may not be integers. It can be any real random number. So it's a real number, but it follows some distribution on real line. Okay. 
say normal distribution or some other distribution doesn't matter distribution don't matter at all here yeah, i don't want to talk about the distributions but the point is you take a step take a continuous step so you take a real number step following certain distribution whatever that is okay prefix distribution all particles after splitting will take exact same will follow the exact same distribution to to take a step but now the steps are not necessarily integers but steps are real numbers <clears throat> also there will be one more complication so there is two complications now okay so one complication is this one the step sizes real are real random numbers so step sizes are real num numbers which are random so they are no, no longer integers second complication earlier i was always having each particle was splitting into two particles so number of offspring particles was two now i will allow number of offspring particles to be other than two it can be even a random number of offsprings so offspring particles can be a random non negative integer so what i mean by that is that each particle will split into a random number of particles that's also allowed however this one i put in a lighter color because this is not going to be so important for us if you don't see what it is don't worry about it so instead of having you can always assume that each particle is splitting into two okay even then all the thing that i am going to talk about so in 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 other words i'm talking about binary branching random walk binary meaning binary coming from two splitting into two that also is good enough for understanding okay but in practice binary is too too easy or too simple and physicists call it a toy model in physics typically people study what is called a toy model so toy models are models which are easy to study which are easy to analyze and investigate and you know get results out of them and then you you may make it more complicated one step of the other okay so what we are studying is a toy model we are only studying the binary branching random walk meaning each particle is splitting into two particles or each bacterium is producing two bacteria two offspring bacteria at a time okay anyway i should say a little bit of history this model first came up in 1976 so it was this it was discovered by begins in 1976 but his work begins work was based on two papers one by hammersley and another one by kingman so therefore when people talk about branching random walk they always refer to hammersley kingman and begins so that's the history of this subject now why is it important so somebody asked why it is important why is branching why is random walk important i i told in in a very hand waving manner that it helps in study of brownian motion branching random walk on the other hand is very important okay so the question is how can one take an irrational step so basically what you do is you take a step so the question was this is the question from youtube how can one take an irrational step so this is basically you prefix a distribution on real line and then take a step according to that okay so what you what i mean by that is that you can take any number but there is a probability of taking various values attached to them okay, i'm i'm being very hand wavy here i cannot be more formal than that sorry now why is it important so branching random walks appear in many contexts starting from biology to statistical physics now biology of course it's it's clear why biology because i told uh, this instead of particles this can be bacterium and a colony of bacteria that i am trying to model and then of course it comes in up naturally in mathematical biology physics of course again because it deal, deals with uh, deals with uh, particles now it can be used to describe how a growing population of bacteria or particles 
invades a new environment. Okay, it's a model for growth in some sense. As you see, if it's binary branching at every time it's doubling, right? So it's growing, the population is growing. So how is the growing population invading the environment? That's, <clears throat> that's what is important. And that's, uh, you know, branching random work helps in studying that. Now in our very simplified model, we are allowing particles to move along a sing single line, okay? Only a line and all, or even integers to start with, we started with integers, right? More complicated model can also be considered when particle moves in a plane, say particles are moving on a, on a table, okay? Or it's moving on a, or inside a room or inside a box, etc. Now, for the purpose of this talk, we shall restrict ourselves to the simple model, toy model, as I say, everything is happening on a line. And we'll talk about long run configuration of the positions of the particles. Now, long run configuration, something I'm going to explain to you. Before that, let me answer this question. Can it random walk with reproduction be used in the effective crawling of web content? It's quite possible. R. Goel has asked a very good question. Can branching random walk be used in the effective crawling of web content? It's quite possible that this, is, this can be used. Whether anybody has used it or not is the question. But you are right, it's quite possible that this, it can be used. I have not seen any, any, uh, any use of that, but I, would, I would, won't be surprised if it is used for effective crawling of web content. By the way, I'm, I want to make a little bit of a digression. Statistical physics, what does it mean? Well, I'm not a physicist, but I do know what it means. I teach probability to my students and I always tell them that physics is very much related to statistical physics. Sorry, probability is very much related to statistical physics. And the reason is statistical physics is a branch of physics that deals with statistical models and explaining physics using statistical models and or probabilistic models. And that is why this, this term statistical physics is very close to mathematics. In fact, this com compartmentalization of subjects, physics, maths, etc., is actually not such a good thing. I always think that one should have a very broad perspective. In science, everything is related with each other. Okay? Physics is related to biology, biology is related to maths, maths is related to physics, chemistry, etc. Statistical physics is one such example where you know, it's an intersection of statistics and physics. Can anyone tell me a name of a statistical physicist? There's an Indian physicist, classical physicist, whose name is famous with another very famous physicist. Can anyone guess who he is? Yes, Bose. Which Bose? Okay, S.N. Bose. So S.N. Bose, his name comes up along with Al Albert Einstein. There's something called Bose-Einstein statistics. So I'll just write it here. Oh, again, I always make this mistake. I don't know why. Okay. So Bose-Einstein statistics. Whatever that is, that's statistics. Whatever that thing is, I don't want to talk about it because that will take me away. But this is an example of an, an example of statistical physics. Okay. <clears throat> so one more question I want to ask. There's a very famous statistical physicist of this generation who won a very important medal called Boltzmann Medal. There's a medal called Boltzmann's name you must have heard. Boltzmann was a very important statistical physicist. Who, who that person is? Somebody already answered, Deepak Dhar, yes. So Deepak Dhar, who is a very famous statistical physicist, recently won Boltzmann Medal. And Boltzmann Medal is the highest honor in statistical physics. And this came out in the newspaper. It's a huge thing for Indian science. He's the first Indian physicist who won this Boltzmann Medal. 
and he's now a scientist of ISR Pune, IISER Pune. But he used to be his entire career before retirement, he spent in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. Okay, so enough of trivia. Now let me tell you what is uh, what do I mean by long run configuration. It's something like this. So recall that a branch in random walk is a growing collection of particles of organism that starts from a single particle and branch and spread independently of each other, right? Suppose I let the dynamics run for many, many generations, a million generations, a zillion generations. How would the snapshot look like? Remember, I showed you the snapshot of generation one, generation two, then generation three, right? But if I had gone on and finally showed you the gen, you know, gen, generation million snapshot, how did it look like? Of course, it's a very vague question, but question is how would it look in the long run? Okay, that's what I mean by long run configuration. Okay, so the long run configuration is of great importance in statistical physics, mathematical biology, and also probability theory. So basically it means something like this. So think of it this way. Suppose these are particles, which if they become very dense can explode. I'm just giving you an example. This is just a fictitious example. Now, suppose you grow them, let them grow in, in a room. If one, in partic one particular direction in the room, the density of the particles is too high, there'll be an explosion. Then of course you need to know how the, how the densities of the particles will grow you know, uh, with time. And in particular, what happens after a million generations. So that's why this long run configuration is important. Somebody said the following, somebody asked, peak after nth and the peak after nth generation, how does it grow? So peak after nth generation is one of the important facets of long run configuration. Okay. Okay, so uh, somebody asked the question, equivalent to the distributions of products of PIs and Is? Uh, sorry, uh, this question I'm not understanding fully. So uh, would you mind? Uh, uh, can you, uh, Anupam, can you please uh, unmute this person, Arush, and maybe ask? Yes, yes. Question. Yeah, him or her ask the question. Yeah, or him perhaps. Yeah. Uh, my question was uh, yes. more of a response to uh, the question that was asked of what would the distribution look like and right. uh, when it does a branching random walk. I am um, trying to confirm if it would be based on the expected distance. Is it equivalent to the distribution of expected distance? Yes, it's the distribution of the distance. Yes, yes, you're right. I mean, what you what you said is you have the right intuition. Yeah, it's the distribution of the distance you travel in one one generation. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is exactly. Okay, so a few more questions have come. Let me quickly check if uh, anything needs to be quickly answered. Okay, so one is uh, Fahad has asked the following question. So yeah, let me, one minute, I'll make this window a bit bigger. So I'm following the chat from my laptop and giving the talk using my iPad, but I've not done it before. So this is something new to me. Okay, like a damped wave symmetric uh, y-axis. Uh, yeah, you can think of it as a damped wave, but it's not really a damped wave, but there is some similarity, of course. Okay, R. Goel has asked, will such a self-reproductive system have any information processing capability? Uh, it's quite possible. I, I know that branching random work does have some application in computer science in algorithms, but I don't know the exact applications. So, uh, Maybe in the long run, as you said, we'll be seeing some patterns and that will help in the algorithms, cellular automata, et cetera. So I don't know this. This is not my cup of tea, honestly. But I know that branching random work does have applications uh, to, uh, to other things. Okay, so let me check the chat here. Okay, so uh, another question was slide 37. Can we expect symmetry? Yes, there'll be a symmetry, of course. The symmetry is coming from the fact, oh, okay, it depends on whether your step size distribution is symmetric or not. So the question was, the question you can see, right? The last one, can we expect symmetry in the system? You will see a symmetry in the system provided you, uh, you have symmetry in the step size distribution. 
Okay, if your step size distribution is symmetric, then you will see symmetry in the system. Yes, you're right. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the talk. So, so long run configuration is very important. Can this idea be used for COVID modeling? That's the latest question. And this is a very important question. I have no idea. Honestly, uh, virus, unlike <coughs> bacterium, they don't move themselves. Virus needs a medium to move. We are at the mediums, right? That's why we got the disease. So I actually don't know if branching random walk has any use in COVID modeling, but there are other models coming from statistical physics and probability theory that have been used in COVID modeling. Okay, I'm not an expert, but I know that there has been such models. Okay, thanks for the question. It would be great if we can use it for COVID modelings, but I don't know. Okay, so now related to the title, but I have not gone to the theorem yet. I'm still asking a question. Now, what are the two conjectures that I was there in the title of the talk? I'm going to be very, very, very vague now. So far, things were more followable perhaps, but now I'm going to become very vague. Okay. So, two statistical physicists, Brune and Derrida, they made the following conjecture. The long run configuration of the particles or the positions of the particles is what they call a decorated Poisson point process. Now, I'm not going to explain to you what that means. This is not possible for me. And they also said that this long run configuration exhibits superposability property. Somebody talked about superposability earlier, and I, I'm sure you had some intuition somewhere, which you know, I could not understand at the time, but superposability is important. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to come to that. So also Brune and Derrida asked in the same paper, they asked the question, are one and two the same? One meaning being a decorated Poisson point process in the limit and having superposability property in the limit, are they equivalent? Are, this, are they the same concepts? Now, since I'm not explaining to you what these terminologies mean, the question also would become very vague to you. I'll try to do a little bit of justification of what I'm talking about, but I can't do too much. But before that, let me answer a few things. There was a theorem of Pascal Maya in 2013, Pascal proved that, yes, these two are actually equivalent. They are the same concepts under certain conditions. So Pascal needed, Amaya needed certain conditions to prove that being a decorated Poisson point process, whatever that is, is same as satisfying superposability property. Thomas Madhu, in a paper in 2017, proved that one and two hold under the same conditions as Pascal Maya. So what Thomas proved, Thomas Madhul proved, was he proved that the limit, the limiting configuration or the long run configuration is indeed, is indeed a decorated Poisson point process, whatever that means. And it does exhibit superposability property. In fact, proving one of them is good enough because of the theorem of Pascal Mayer. So therefore, what actually Madhul proved, Madhul actually proved that the limit, the limiting configuration is, does satisfy superposability property. And then the other one, namely the fact that it is a decorated Poisson process that transpired from Myler's, Myers theorem, Maya, that the pronunciation is Maya. Uh, pass, this, 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 these are both French people. So the pro name pronunciation is weird. Anyway, so a Pascal Maya's theorem, it follows. So the key question is there are some conditions, right? I'll tell you what the conditions are. And same conditions were used by Madhul also. So Pascal Maya and Thomas Madhul assumed certain conditions. The question is, what if those conditions are not satisfied? Will the conjectures of Brune and Derrida still hold? And the answer is yes. We have been able to show that yes, the answer is yes. Okay, 
Now, what is superposition? So I'll tell you, okay, I, I'm, although I'm not going to tell you what is a decorated Poisson point process, I'm going to tell you what is superposability. Now, what does it mean? What is superposition? Suppose you have a picture which looks like this, and you have another picture which looks like this. If you superpose them, you will see this picture. What I mean is this plus that is equal to this. Superposition just means you're just putting one on top of the other and getting the output. Superposability roughly means the following. Superposability means, suppose two people among the audience, okay, are running branch in random box on two different number lines, independently of each other. We let both of them run the dynamics for a million generations and look at the snapshots. Now, Superposability means the following. Again, this is very roughly. If you superpose these two pictures, these long run pictures, million generation pictures, we won't see any qualitative difference between them and also the new picture, the superposed picture. So superposability means after superposing two different pictures, qualitatively, you won't see any difference. Qualitatively, it's very similar. Now, this has a more formal description. The statistical physicists, when they define a terminology, they actually define it mathematically. So this definition is there, but I don't want to go into it. So roughly speaking, this just means that two different run of branching random walk in the, in the limit, you know, in the long run, if you superpose them, you won't see any qualitative difference. Okay, any question right now, before I go to the completely last part of the talk? So this decorated Poisson point process that I told you about, I'm not going to tell you what that is. Okay. So this is the main uh, thing. Maybe, maybe I'll just go back. <coughs> yeah. So this is the main uh, thing. And uh, the point is, there are some conditions under which things have been proved. We have gone beyond those conditions. Now, what are these new conditions? So before telling you what are these new conditions, I should tell you what are roughly speaking, the conditions of Pascal Maya and Thomas Madhu. What are the conditions under which they could verify Brune and Derrida conjecture? So there is a question, does it make sense to talk about what is the probability of one fixed number being hit at least once? That's a very good question, yes. Definitely Rukmini, it's definitely makes sense. If the distribution of the step size is a discrete, then yes. But if the distribution of the step size is continuous, then the probability would be zero, say if it's normal or something. But when, the dis when, when you are only walking on the number integer line, say, so your distribution is supported on integers, then what you're asking is a very good question. Yes, definitely, definitely. Those questions arise naturally. Okay, so <coughs> what are the conditions? What kind of conditions? So firstly, Madhul and Maya, what they had, they forced the step sizes to be very small. So in other words, the step sizes cannot be too big. That's what their assumption was. Well, the assumption was something more mathematical, but the assumption implied that the step sizes are not going to be very high most of the time. Now, key question is, what if we allow bigger step sizes? And this is something I didn't write, I wanted to write and I forgot. Bigger step sizes are very important in ecology. So they are important in ecology. So the key, the key phrase is levy flights. Now, what are Levy flights? So I don't want to talk about it, but the point is, if you look at the dynamics in a jungle, how the predators are following the prey, the distribution of the distance traveled by the predators follow something called a Levy flight. So in particular, they take a lot of big step sizes. So in ecological context, bigger step sizes are very useful. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, now here, 
the question is how can you make the step sizes bigger so decorated poisson point process is equivalent to superposability this was the question of brune and derrida now how can you make step sizes bigger so if you already have some step size you want to make them bigger what can you do one of the things that you can do is you exponentiate them so instead of x you take the map okay maybe i'll write in instead of x you go to e power x things would become bigger right 500 is not a big number but e power 500 is quite a big number so that's what we are going to do exponentiate okay similarly you can exponentiate the decorated poisson point process now what transpires if you exponentiate is that the superposability becomes what is called stability now this is again another concept that i'm just throwing you in and the decorated poisson point process becomes scale decorated poisson point process and then you can go back by taking log so one of the proofs of pascal maya would be you exponentiate your step sizes use stability and then use the work of davidov molchanov and zuev from 2008 and 2011 to go to scale decorated person point process and then go to decorated person point process and vice versa so that's one of the proofs but pascal maya gave a very different proof of the fact that these two concepts are equivalent so this was answering the question of brune and derrida now the conclusion is that in our setup therefore since we have big step sizes exponentiation will give you big step sizes right and log will make them smaller so that's why you know we take log decorated poisson point process should be replaced by scale decorated poisson point process that's the right thing to look at and superposability should be replaced by stability and what we could prove is that under this change of replacing dppp by scdppp and superposability by stability we could prove that brune and derrida conjectures hold in our setup and we could also show that the long run configuration is actually scale decorated poisson point process and we could explicitly compute the long run configuration and this is something was missing even when the step sizes are small when the step sizes are small it's known to be decorated poisson point process but that's through superposability so pas sorry uh, thomas madul proved that it's superposable and hence with the help of Pascal Maya's work, could prove that it's a decorated Poisson point process. He could not explicitly tell you what is the limiting configuration, but we could do that in the in this case. And step sizes can be big. Okay, so this is the theorem that I referred to. There was two two conjectures and a theorem. So this is the theorem that of ours that I was referring to. So these are my collaborators. Ayan Bhattacharya was my PhD student in ISI Kolkata. He is now an assistant professor in IIT Bombay. And uh, Rajat was my colleague as ISI Kolkata. Now he has uh, unfortunately moved to Leiden University, unfortunately, because it's a big loss. He's a very good mathematician. It's a big loss for uh, Indian academia. But anyway, uh, he's doing very well there also in Leiden. And uh, apart from my collaborators, I would also like to acknowledge my um, roommate from my hostel, Mohitosh Kejriwal, who is a very uh, good econometrician. He found some typos in the first version of the slides. And also my school friend, Shudip Todash, is, again, he's, he's also a statistician, for suggesting how to explain superposition using pictures. So it's his idea, the superposition pictures that I showed you. So thank you very much. I think. Uh, time to finally go for questions etc okay so i think there are some questions already so let me go back to them uh, before that let's thank the speaker for a wonderful talk thank you so much Parthanin. well it's and, an honor thank you and uh, let's go now for the questions again okay so let's take them one by one so now a lot of questions are there maybe i'll what i would do is i'll go here to the chat. Yeah, so let's see. I think Professor Gopakumar had a question. Uh, Professor Gopakumar, you can unmute and ask. 
Oh, yes, please go ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, no, that was a clap. Uh, that was a. Uh... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you can also clap here, right? Using this. Uh... <laughs> right. Uh, that was one of the uh, emojis. That's all. Right, 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 right. But thanks anyway for the. I talk. had a very yeah. quick question. Yes, can yes, I please. ask? So, sure, is, go ahead, go ahead. is superposability uh, very much related to only Poisson point processes yes, or yes. is it possible in other situations? Also? No, no, no. It, this, this is the theorem of, uh, theorem of uh, Pascal Maya now. It was a conjecture of uh, Brunet and Derrida, but now our theorem of Pascal Maya is oh, that okay. yes, okay. it has to be it has to be Poissonian. Yeah, okay. without Poissonian, you ha you won't have the symmetry. Superposability. So yeah. superposability is some kind of symmetry, right? And because it, because it's a limit, so I can be a little bit more mathematical now. So because it's a limit, it sat does satisfy some some symmetry, and that's exactly what is superposability is all about. And that's that symmetry, that superposability symmetry makes it very restrictive and then therefore it has to be a Poissonian thing yeah but it's not a direct Poisson it's a, um, a, de a derivative of Poisson in some okay. sense yeah. that's you. why they call it it yes yeah okay so from YouTube there is a question uh, why do they tend to, to one distribution and not many equally probability distribution so that's a very good question there are models where people actually choose from various distributions so instead of one distribution, you go for various distributions. So even in even in random walk, forget about branching random walk. Even in random walk, you may I say the following: Why would I always take a same distribution to do the step sizes? Why won't I choose from a pool of distributions as Ishwar Ishwar has suggested? That has a name. It came from statistical physics again, and the name is branch. It's sorry, not branching random walk in random environment okay the, the name is random walk in random environment so the random environment refers to choosing one distribution from a pool of distribution as Ishwar has said similar things can be done in branching random walk world as well and there are work on branching random walk on random environment also Okay, uh, Fahad has asked long range configuration in density distribution. Yes, long range, long range density. Yes, yes, you're right. Essentially, eventually, after a long, long time, how does the density of particles look like in various, yeah, various spaces? Yes, very good. Okay, so rest are all thanking, etc. So yes, uh, the honor was all mine, honestly. So I mean, this was a very good group of people who asked many questions. Oh, the difference between Maya and uh, Madhul? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do that. One minute. I'll go back here. So <clears throat> the, there are two different papers. Pascal's paper, Pascal Maya's paper. Okay, so let me go back here. Yeah. So this one, this paper said, answered. Okay, maybe I'll use some other color. The contrast should be there. Yeah. So this particular one, they answered that this was a this this was a question. Remember, are decorated Poisson point process and superposability the same? And Pascal Maya answered that they are the same under some conditions. So this was the Pascal's paper, Maya's paper. On the other hand, there were conjectures of Brune and Derrida, namely DPP and and <coughs> superposability property. This was proved by Madhul. So Madhul proved that one and two hold under the same conditions as Pascal Maya. Okay, so this is the difference between the two. Okay, so, uh, so other questions? One minute. Okay, Shagnik has asked the question, what if the limit, we limit the number of particles at a given site, any generation allow for particles to slide into? Okay. <clears throat> Let me go here and yeah. So then you can see the question. All of you can see the question now. Shagnik Gorai's question is what I'm looking at. Particle to slide into the next site in the same generation. Uh, this question I'm not understanding fully, but let me try to see. 
okay okay so i understand so what if we allow so each each site has a capacity so if one site has too many particles will make them go to the other one so this is this is a different model than shagli okay so if you if you have a capacity limit and one the moment the capacity is full you let the particles slide to the next neighbor next door neighbor then it's a different model and i don't think anybody has really looked into such models okay also you may also allow interactions between particles here we are not assuming that if two particles move, meet in a site they 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 ignore each other right but in real life it can so happen that the particles will destroy each other or the particles will coalesce and become one particle together okay the particle will confluent you know they will become one particle okay so the coalescence or or killing is something we haven't assumed in this model but it's possible that you know it is it can be done but then we don't know the answers there also okay okay next question is it possible to use different statistical model to explain the branching and if no how does it affect the final result okay so this is again a good question um uh, as long as certain conditions are satisfied so far we haven't seen any limit that is not poissonian okay but it is quite possible that you no know, every time we make some assumption and then do the analysis right so it's quite possible that maybe there is some other limit possible under some extra conditions but my guess is this is just my naive guess whatever we do we cannot go beyond poissonian things because superposability if it has to satisfy it has to become something related to poissonian okay this was related to the question that uh, rukmini asked okay so if it's superposable does it have to be poisson the answer is yes okay so, so far at least whatever we have got superposability in any form whether it's superposability or stability becomes related to poissonian kind of point processes okay uh, another question quantitatively what would be the distribution of a branching random walk look like uh qualitatively sorry well distribution of branching random walk meaning you mean after n generation how it would look like it's a very complicated distribution because it's a it's a convolution of many distributions so unfortunately the distribution of n generation the joint distribution of the particles of n generation is very very difficult to explain okay because there are first of all too many particles in n generation there are two power n many particles which is already the number is very high and then their dis joint distribution is very complicated they are they are very complicated dependents and the dependence is not even stationary so it's you know in what you know you cannot use any standard stationary process to explain it so it's a very difficult distribution can these ideas be used in random graphs and yes the answer is yes actually these ideas or <clears throat> these ideas have been used in random graphs there is something called uh, what is it called scale free percolation model okay in scale free percolation model people have actually used a coupling with branching random walk to prove theorems on random graphs in fact i have not told you branching random walk has relations not just with random graphs it has relations to gaussian free fields it has relations to uh, many other models okay <clears throat> gaussian multiplicative chaos various things so it's a model that is very useful in statistical physics and probability so the answer to your question sri ram is yes it has relations to random graphs isn't the larger step size case of the same pattern with this with smaller step size yeah okay yeah so well quantitatively they are different so decorated poisson point process and scale decorated poisson point process are different okay you may say in a very high 
qualitative level, they're same in the sense that one is superposable, another is stable. Both of them satisfy certain symmetry, but their actual form is very different. So when stop, small step size case, in fact, in the small step size case, the explicit limit is not even known, but whatever is known, it says it, you know, the rate of growth, etc. For example, if you look at the maximum and how the maximum grows, etc. If you look at the, say, you look at the rightmost particle in the nth generation and see how far it is from the origin. In the, in the case that we studied, it can be shown that such a thing grows in a polynomial, grows, grows like a polynomial in n. Okay. It grows like n power something. Okay. On the other hand, for uh, for the small tail case, like sorry, for small step size case, this grows in like log something. Okay. So this is very very different dynamics is going on there. So there's a lot of quantitative difference between the two. Okay. So anything else? So I guess yeah. there are no more questions from YouTube. Okay. So just one question Sridham has asked here. Yeah. So thank you for the nice words. And then, yeah, random graphs be used for, if, I think random graphs are, random graphs are used for studying infectious diseases. Yes. There are various models of uh, random graphs that are used. Spread of infection has that has many random rough models. So yes, they are useful. <coughs> okay, yeah. if there are no more questions. Thank you again, Parthanil, for yeah. this very interesting talk. And uh, yeah, it was a great pedagogical talk as someone. Oh, thank you. I, I was very slow today because I had a cold, so. No, no, that was good. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank we can you. have a follow up, follow up lecture sometime. Somebody has asked, will there be a follow up lecture? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Some other time, yeah. Some other time, yeah, certainly. But the, those who are in Bangalore, I mean, this copy with curiosity is also a very good uh, thing that you can go to and uh, in Jawaharlal Nehru. Planetarium, auditorium, these talks are, uh, are there. And those are also very nice. They're not necessarily on mathematics all the time, but I've attended a few and they're very nice. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay, then. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>